All right, good girl. All right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. You can ask gardening questions down below this video. And I pick from those each week. I try to pick some that are relevant to whatever's going on uh, at that time. I appreciate you guys' um, participation in this and continuing to ask great questions uh, down below the video. Since the last one went up, it got very cold. Um, actually, it was cold while I was shooting that. Uh, last Friday is when the temperature was actually dropping. Um, and then that video went up Sunday and by then it was like peak cold. So I know some of you probably have some little bit of damage in your garden and uh, hopefully um, ho hopefully not too bad. I've had some, I put up a video earlier this week about the damage out here and weirdly a few, a couple of the things I was a little concerned about, it popped right back out of it, but then so a couple other things that I hadn't even paid any attention to, uh, like the, um, the evergreen dogwood out front, the Empress of China dogwood. It's definitely got some burn on the top of it. I'm hoping I didn't lose the flower buds on it um, and just and just it's a little leaf damage because that thing, it's not smart enough to turn itself off. It just kind of keeps growing. So I'm thinking that, what are you doing back here? Um, you just hanging out? Uh, so I'm hoping that it's, you know, the, the actual flower buds weren't damaged. But other than that, it's not too bad uh, out here. There'll be a little bit of pruning that needs to be done on some things, but a lot of things needed pruning anyway. So you know, if you, again, you can watch that video earlier this week and basically I'm just saying that I'm not going to do anything um, uh, until I know where to cut things, you know, as the damage really appears. And sometimes, you know, the, the buds along the stems weren't damaged and so there won't be any real reason to cut it, you know, what, cut something way back. She just laid down right there in that same spot. Okay, so um, on the Learn to Garden video series that's on my website, uh, there's a $50 coupon. I've been talking about it for a few weeks. It's going away on January 3rd, I think is the last day for the $50 off on it. Uh, the video that I put up this past week is a vocabulary video, and it's just basically a lot of soil related vocabulary, um, perennials, annuals, you know, some of the, some of the, the words that get thrown around and how they're used in horticulture versus maybe how they're used in botany, because sometimes that's a little bit different. And uh, there'll be a couple more of those videos over time as I do, pro I'm gonna do some propagation videos on the Learn to Garden series. And those videos will come with a, a set of a vocabulary video that goes with that, so on and so forth. Um, but when I do pruning videos, I'll probably go through a list of um, tools and other things and do a vocabulary video that attaches to that, so on and so forth. But there'll be videos every week on that during the year. Thank you to those of you who have signed up already. And again, um, there'll be a disc, I think there's gonna be a $25 discount permanently to those of you watching the channel. But if you do it before the third, um, as you're watching this on the first, um, happy new year, by the way, um, then, uh, then you can get $50 off. Uh, let's see, um, the January, what to do, uh, garden, the January gardening video went up as well this past week, just show, talking about the things I'm doing out here in January, which really isn't much, it was more, just me yapping away about things I'll be doing in February <laughs> to make a video for January. It's not a whole lot, you know, it's some basic maintenance. But I will say that having the soil loose, uh, you know, with the little bit of moisture in the ground, you know, I understand it's frozen, you know, further north, but here where the ground is workable, uh, I did, it's definitely easier to do some digging and some edging and creating new beds, pulling out some grassy weeds, uh, a lot of those tasks can be so, you know, somewhat easier while the, while the ground is moist and it's not 95 degrees outside. So just throwing that out there. Uh, let's see, um, somebody, uh, uh, let's get to some questions from, 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 this, from this past week. Somebody asked, what are my thoughts on using wilt proof? There's several uh, sprays that you can spray on plants to keep the wind from desiccating them. And they work great. I mean, lots of farmer, farmers use them. Um, you know, they're definitely worth using. I always wonder, you know, um, I don't like to do things in my garden that set me up for having to do them forever. I don't actually want to feel like I'm a, uh, you know, you know, like, like I'm working for the garden. I want the garden to kind of work for me. So if I've put things out here that are going to have to be sprayed in some way, whether it's you know, through some organic thing, non-organic thing, whatever it is. If it's something I'm gonna to have to repeatedly do, I might go back and ask myself, well, what if I put something behind it to kind of block the wind, a, a fence or some other plant that's less susceptible to that wind damage, that kind of thing. 
but yes, it works great. But I don't like to, I don't like to have to think about, you know, wow, I really need to think about this. Three times this winter, I'm going to get crazy winds coming from the northeast, and you know, how am I going to protect these things? I don't, I, I really wouldn't, I really just wouldn't want to be trapped into anything like that. But yes, uh, those anti-desiccate sprays work great, uh, and lots, lots of farmers use them. Um, obviously, it's their livelihood, so you know, if they have to go out and do it, they're doing it, you know, to keep, keep the lights on at the house. Okay, so um, somebody has bagworms on their neighbor's conifers, uh, their arborvitae or thuja, what, junipers maybe it was, I don't remember. Um, and they've got some conifers in their garden, want to know if you know, they should be concerned about them crossing over. Maybe, um, you know, the thing with bagworms is, with, and with most insect problems, most disease problems, most probably a lot of this cold damage that you've seen, uh, on plants that are supposed to be hardy in your area, a lot of vulnerability in plants comes from them being stressed uh, in some way. So, if your garden is well maintained, uh, if you're, you know, keeping it mulched, keeping it fertilized, keeping things watered, your plants seem vigorous. You see less of those types of issues in them. Not that you can't get bagworms on a perfectly healthy plant, but it's a lot less likely. Uh, if 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 all of these insect problems were able to just attack any plant they wanted to, any time they wanted to, then we'd be in trouble. You know, what's preventing them from being on some plants while they are on others? And, you know, that question, you know, that really does come down to the health of the plant. You know, just like us, when we're healthy and happy and whatever, we tend to be able to fight off things a little better, but it doesn't mean you can always fight things off. So the answer is maybe, but if your garden is healthy, I'm less worried about it. Um, I would be much less worried about it. Uh, and, you know, you don't see, you know, if you came here today or, you know, during the summertime when we would see more of those kinds of insect disease issues, you'll see very little of it out here. I mean, the garden is growing, it's vigorous. I've got a lot of diversity in the garden. And so, you know, maybe something that eats something else is living here because I offered it at home. I've talked about that quite a bit. Somebody's got some, uh, some of the variegated abelia and uh, sunshine Ligustrum, which should be in the frame, the gold plant right there, uh, and it got pretty badly burned. Both of those will come back out for the most part. The abelia, you'll probably have to cut back to where the burn is on it. Um, the sunshine ligustrum, you could probably park your car on it. It'll still come back out <laughs> from it uh, eventually. Sometimes they can do some shedding, some um, weird shedding toward the end of winter where they're kind of naked for a few weeks. It seems to happen like every other year, every third year, something like that, but that one looks pretty good right now. It's missing a little bit of color on it because it's not in just that time of year. Uh, but it's, it was fun. That one didn't get burned at all, but I have seen a couple that were, that were burned some. And I saw one at the Ralston Arboretum the other day. It was pretty, pretty badly burned. Speaking of the Ralston, I have a couple videos I'm shooting with Mark Wethington, the director at the Ralston this week. And it's just a post freeze uh, videos there on some things that for great winter interest that held up well uh, during the uh, during the freeze. So I'm pretty excited about that video and a couple other things I'm visiting uh, this next week uh, that should be should be good um, winter winter content. Let's see. So somebody said, how do they prep for wildflower seeds? Um, and wanted to know whether they start, should start them indoors or outdoors. If you're just doing one of those wildflower mix packs of seed, uh, you can just seed that directly, you know, at the time on the back of the package that it says to. So I don't know what your, what kind of seeds you have. Some, there are some um, bachelor buttons and poppies and things that you could be doing now or would have already even done uh, at this point. And then there's others that you wouldn't do till closer to your frost free date in March, April, May, whenever that is. But bed prep wise, uh, the seed doesn't come up and do all that well in our bark mulched space. Well, I don't want to say bark because pine bark would be okay. Um, but our like woody uh, bark mulches, uh, seed doesn't necessarily do all that well. So I would get it down to to get some, get rid of that stuff if you have it. Like you know, I wouldn't do the seed mix over pine straw, uh, but get it down to bare ground and then compost that space uh, if you've. You know, if it's a completely new space to you, you might want to till it. I don't recommend tilling very often, but when something is brand new, uh, it might be beneficial to till some compost down in there and get the soil awake 
and then seed them directly into some compost uh, or compost and pine bark mix, something like that. And I think you'll have better success with it. That soil mix will stay wetter on the top and offer those plants that, you know, seed to be able to germinate a little bit easier. You might have to protect that area from some squirrels and other critters from stealing your seeds. I do most of my seeding in the house, but I don't, I wouldn't do one of those wildflower mix packets like that. I would definitely throw that out. But I think you want a prepped space in order for it to pre perform at its highest. That doesn't mean if you didn't, if you walked out the door and you had a bed that was mulched and you slung that seed out, that something wouldn't come up and perform well. So it doesn't mean nothing will do well. It just means that a little bit of prep uh, might go a long way in making a bigger, a higher percentage of it uh, do well. And then you can fertilize them at the same time. If it's something that gets seeded out April 1st or April 15th or something like that, um, prep the space, compost it, perhaps till it if it's never been worked before, and then throw your seed out on top of that. And you can take a garden rake and gently, gently, gently get the seed barely, barely covered. Um, and uh, that'll help keep it from washing away. But that, that's how I would go about it and then water it every few days, um, just lightly over the top. Keep in mind, you're not trying, you don't have roots on anything. If it's a seed, you just need to keep the seed bed moist. This is the same thing with seeding a lawn. No real point in going out there and watering six inches deep for seed. Uh, there's no roots on it. So just to, you're just very frequently and very superficially uh, keep it moist. Okay. Um, so they, somebody's got some emerald arborvitae that are splayed open from the snow and how to go about fixing that. That's just that is a chronic problem uh, with, with emerald arborvitae, especially multi-trunked ones. If they've ended up multi-trunked um, over time, they can easily uh, splay open. I think the best way to go about that is probably to put some sort of post down the middle of it and then tie the limbs up to it. So if you can get some sort of um, tree stake and just drive it down being careful, you can usually find a spot somewhere around the plant where you can um, stick the post down in and hammer it down in there and then pull limbs up on it. And then you're probably gonna shear a bit of it as well. Uh, you know, take some of the weight off of it and allow, that'll give it an opportunity to stand back up. But I don't think if it's bad, um, you can wait and see if it's minor, if it'll kind of stand back up on its own or whether or not you can just kind of prune that piece off and it'll fill back in a bit. If it's minor, that's probably the way I would do it. If it's really splayed open and you're, um, I think you got to lighten the load on them a bit, shear them a bit, and then tie them up. Um, kind of hard, maybe hard to, visual, hard to visualize. Um, somebody asked, are butterfly bushes invasive? It completely depends on where you are. Uh, old butterfly bush varieties in the Pacific Northwest. They're wildly invasive in Great Britain and other parts of Europe, wildly invasive. Never seen one in the woods here. I've seen a couple germinate here or there under some like Nanho Blue for some reason. I've seen germinate a few seedlings around one, but I've never seen it out further than that. So it's kind of weird that it be, you know, invasive in one place and not another. Um, Maybe it's cold temperatures uh, that we're getting, preventing it from uh, the seed from being, I don't know what it is. Something, there's something different about the Pacific Northwest coast and the um, Western coast of, uh, of Great Britain. I, I, don't know what the I don't know what the difference is other than their temperature range is slightly smaller than mine. Don't know why, uh, but they're wildly invasive in those places. And that's the case with a lot of plants where it's gonna be Somebody's invasive is controlled somewhere else. I've mentioned Lantana many times. Lantana's, some Lantana's terribly invasive in Florida and up here, um, winter controls it. We don't have barberry, I mean, we, we, have, we have lots of invasives, but for some reason we don't really have the barberries and the, uh, uh, and the uh, burning bush uh, going absolutely crazy here. We do have burning bush. I mean, I've seen, I've seen occasionally I'll see burning bush somewhere, but not, nothing like it is up in the Northeast. So uh, it's kind of interesting. One thing though that's really is changing very rapidly is we're seeing plants introduced now. Those ornamental plants that were invasive were brought here for a reason. They're good ornamental plants. It's just they got out and, you know, um, unfortunately, 
are now you know competing with our native uh, our native plants but those plants are now you know being re-looked at and and, and re-released as plants that are sterile um, we've seen sterile cultivars of butterfly bushes um, uh, barberries barberry <laughs> put up the Southern Living Plant Collection video two weeks ago and everybody's like, I can't believe you'd recommend barberries. But that barberry is, you know, not invasive. It's, you know, it's a sterile uh, cultivar. Uh, I think it won an award for that. Uh, and then uh, uh, Nandinas we've seen that are sterile cultivars. A couple, um, uh, so, and there's a difference between sterile and it just hasn't become invasive yet. We saw this with like the Bradford pear where um, the Bradford, Bradford pears weren't sterile, they just didn't have a dance partner. And then the dance partner was offered up and it made viable seed and has became, become a, an invasive. So, you know, let's separate those two things where uh, just because something's not making seed doesn't necessarily mean it won't make seed if it had the proper partner uh, to do it, to, you know, to, to you know, male and female parts uh, to make viable seed. Uh, so that's a possibility, but I'm talking about actual engineered plants to be seed free that's important that's the important differentiation between those two um, but we're seeing more of that but yes the answer is yes if you just took a cutting off an old butterfly bush and you know and they're banned in a lot of places they're they're banned in those places i'm talking about okay uh, that's enough of that i guess somebody said their uh, chef's choice rosemary's black interestingly i have two of them one of them was about a one gallon size container when it was planted earlier this year and it is uh black it's not black but it's definitely hurt badly the one that i had planted two years ago uh it's quite vigorous over there it's slightly off colored i showed it in the video earlier this week but it's totally fine it won't be an issue i'll probably have to prune it a bit later in the winter but uh it's interesting the age difference between the two of them seemed to have been the main uh, the main difference between the two of them. If you're trying to grow rosemary and you're pushing the boundaries on rosemary, I know ARP is considered, ARP is considered the most cold uh, tolerant of the ones that are are decent, uh, <laughs> that are decent culinary rosemaries. That's an important part of it, right? What would be the point in growing one if it doesn't, you know, that's the thing about that chef's choice is it was not only picked because it's a nice compact evergreen plant that flowers and, you know, is fragrant and all those things. It's also a good culinary rosemary. So uh, ARP is as well, if you're trying to push the boundaries. Uh, on one, uh, let's see, uh, somebody's got a large maple and they're getting sooty mold on things down below it. Uh, so what sooty mold is, is if you have uh, aphids or sucking insects up in the tree, uh, <laughs> when their secretions from taking sap from the tree uh, drip down on your plants below and then you get a mold that forms on those sticky drippings and it's called sooty mold and it could just be a black film on top of the leaves but it's actually dripping down from the tree up above that tree's obviously under some kind of stress that's um, making it super vulnerable to um, this issue there's not a whole lot you can do about it i mean other than me telling you that you know a, a lot of maples aren't happy in our urban environments. Um, you know, I've got one that I can see right here in my neighbor's front garden. It's going to be gone at some point. The one we had out here is gone. And I couldn't find you an example of a happy, despite the fact that there's probably more planted than any other shade tree, I probably couldn't find you very many happy red maples in the inner, you know, inside our Beltline area of Raleigh, North Carolina. Just not. Uh, they don't like it. They don't like being in con really contracted uh, spaces with curbs and um, sidewalks and housing foundations and all of those kinds of things. They just don't like it. Um, urban environments. Uh, but again, sell them like crazy because they look great in 25 gallon containers. Uh, but I think that tree is going to continue if it's already been stressed. And you'll see that with crepe myrtles too. Crepe myrtles will get a lot of times with crepe myrtles, it's because they got planted in some sort of corner up by a foundation and they're not getting any air movement on them. They're not pruned properly. So they get maybe chopped off and that makes them super full. And that fullness doesn't allow air to get through it. And so you have lots of hiding places in a stressed plant because it's planted, you know, doesn't get enough sunlight maybe. Um, and so it gets serious aphid problems, which of course drip down on the plants down below it. But the tree's under some sort of stress that's, um, keeping it attacked constantly. 
not a lot you can do about it. I mean, you can spray that sooty, you can hose that sooty mold off the plants down below it uh, occasionally if you want to. Um, but I don't know what advice to offer you other than that tree is, the tree's not happy for some reason. It, it may be that you can make the bed bigger that the tree is in, you know, keeping it mulched, keeping it happier, watering it occasionally. You know, um, the tree is part of your garden as well. So it might be that you can improve, uh, improve the conditions for that maple. I don't know, um, haven't seen it. Let's see, um, so somebody asked about, do I have tree roots traveling through this garden? Yeah, I have trees on the back of the property line here, and then I have that na neighbor's maple right there that, you know, they're also terrible rooting uh, out here. And then I have this red bud, red buds are crazy rooting. Um, but, so when I edge the turf out here, any edging I'm doing, a lot of the edging work that I do to differentiate paths, to differentiate the turf, to differentiate things wherever it is in the garden, a lot of that is to cut surface roots uh, on trees and larger growing shrubs and um, cut that off a bit uh, from one space to another uh, and not allow you know a couple things to dominate the entire space. So yeah, there is some of that uh, that I'm doing, of course. The vegetable garden's getting turned over a bit more than other things are, and it's getting new compost added and that kind of thing. So it's, you know, I don't want roots running through my vegetable garden from other things. So yes, <laughs> there are roots traveling through here, but they ain't making it very far. Cause uh, you know, I'm again, I'm going through here occasionally and just redefining my spaces. And that redefin redefining of the spaces will at least take out some of the finer roots that are trying to travel through here and and steal from, steal from their neighbors. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, somebody asked my thoughts on using cow manure. I think it's like any, I mean, it's com composted cow manure is fine uh, in the garden. I think it's like anything else. I don't use, I don't use a lot of the same thing over and over and over again. I do somewhat in the back of my mind think that there's probably metals, you know, heavy metals that, you know, the you know cows eat grass and grass has metals and metals can build up in their, you know, uh, in their system. And, you know, it, so you, you could have, you could be adding metals to your, I don't do the same thing over and over and over again. So if I'm adding, if I went to the store and cow manure was a good price, that might be the compost I use in my vegetable garden this spring. The next spring I might use some other humus. I might use soil cube that you guys have seen me use. I'm going to rotate some just out of some, you know, some, uh, some caution of not building something up in my, uh, of using something over and over and over again and potentially building up some micronutrient that I don't want built up in the soil or macronutrient that I don't want built up in the soil. Okay. Somebody asked me if they can put hardwood mulch over pine straw. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can mulch over your pine straw, but not pine straw like this thick. So, you know, I've talked about several times about, you know, not, going too crazy with the mulch because it does at some point have a hard time breaking down properly and keeping the system working. I'd rather have thin layers of mulch. So if it's just a thin layer of pine straw, heck yeah, go, go for it. But if it's like this thick or, you know, five, six inches thick and you're putting another layer of mulch on top of that, that's probably problematic uh, at some point. So you might want to thin it out if that's the case. Um, but I know some people, you know, have so, such big pine trees that that can happen. It could just keep piling up on itself. Okay, somebody asked me what I think about solar lights in the garden. I like to look at it when I see it, you know, when well, well-placed lighting in a garden, and a lot of landscapers make good money on this. Um, it's not for me. Uh, I don't, I do have a couple little solar lights out by the street on the fence uh, that are very, I mean, they're like you could get out of a car out there and they might help you somewhat if it was really, really dark. Uh, but I think and just as a personal opinion, some of these questions end up being, some of these questions are factual and some of them are opinion. This goes over to opinion for me. I think the night belongs to the night and uh, I would prefer to see the stars. I would love to see every light in the city turned off uh, at some point. I could actually see, could see the stars up there. I don't think it's offering us the kind of protection we think. I think it would be, if you were breaking into houses, I think it'd be much more scary if it was pitch black <laughs> than it is having it well lit out there where they can look through my car and look through everything. Uh, I, think, I think pitch black is the way to go for, the, you know, for, for, for people doing bad things at night. 
uh, I think it's I think it would be much more scary for them uh, and on that note we stayed um, out by the we, when we were doing our visit to Georgia last time we travel in a motorhome and a, a class C motorhome and we had to park out by a road um, when we were visiting someone we didn't have anywhere else to stay it was a, it was a perfectly safe place to be but there was a house like 100 200 feet away that had probably i mean it was like daytime in their front garden i don't know what kind of paranoia had struck them but it was just the brightest place i mean somebody's going to land a plane in there one night but i couldn't imagine being able to sleep inside that house you'd have to have three layers of curtains on every window uh, in the house to sleep it was the most it was the most brightly lit yard i've ever seen so again this goes over into personal opinion i think the night belongs to the night i would prefer it to be dark uh, I would love to see the stars more than I currently see them here in Raleigh. And, but again, when I see it and it's done well and the trees are uplit and, you know, some architectural feature on the house is uh, uplit, I, I get it. I appreciate it. Um, this is not for me. Okay. Opinions get you in trouble, right? Okay. So uh, somebody asked about removing very buried um, landscape fabric. So landscape fabric was put down as a weed prevention fabric, whatever was put down and then like six inches of earth and mulch and other things have built up on top of it over time wanted any advice on it i don't know how, i don't know how to help you um i think you got to go in there uh, if it were mine and this was my property and i was going to be there for some period of time i know that no matter how good that landscape fabric is at some point it's going to start to break down um, the soil underneath it i guarantee is awful uh, no plant's going to ever be happy uh, under that stuff. I know what it smells like. I mean, I, I've pulled up enough of that stuff that's been buried for a while. I, I know the smell of the earth underneath it. Um, it's awful. I think it might be something, you know, it might be one of those areas where uh, if you were ever going to hire somebody to do something, you know, a young person to get some of that material off the top of it so it can be pulled up and rolled out of there and gotten rid of, I'd want it gone. You know, I don't, I would not want it in my garden, and I don't know that you can garden at a really, really high level um, with that rotting, nasty soil that's under that um, that's that, that's under that weed protect you know weed barrier plastic. Um, so um, it, if it were mine, I would want to get. But again, I don't have any like helpful suggestions. Again, I said a few weeks ago about sometimes it's just hard work. Uh, sometimes there's something out there that's just hard work. And I think that's one of them, one of the areas, but I wouldn't hesitate to try to hire a couple high school students, you know, that, uh, want some extra money to help you move a little bit of that off of it. If you can lighten the load on it, it might be much easier for you to do it or hire a company to do it. Um, so somebody said they got a new construction house. It's super compact. Should they get some worms and put them out there? I don't think the worms will survive. Uh, if you're not getting the soil covered uh, initially. So um, uh, you, you might want to go through, I would go through the process of, so you have a couple options. I've talked about this bunches of times. If it were mine, I would get some, get, see if you can get some free wood chips on like chip drop um, or uh, acquire some organic material that you can put on top of this soil and let it come back to life over some period of time. You could also, in new construction like this, this might be an opportunity to put down some compost and till it. This would be another, I've recommended tilling twice uh, here. Um, but you, you're not killing anything with the tiller if nothing's alive. So uh, getting some compost tilled down into it and then putting some organic material on top of it, mulch, wood chips, pine straw, doesn't matter. Um, probably does matter, wood chips being the best. Uh, or just put the wood chips on top and let everything just take its course which is what we did here um, and it works pretty well if you put the eight inches of wood chips on top of it and just be patient uh, for some period of time it will improve your soil radically and then the worms are just going to come on their own amazingly enough the worms are just going to come on their own that's always a funny thing too i don't know where you live but uh, we always talk everybody talks about invasives 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 uh, up in the pacific or up, i mean up in the northeast uh, worms, I don't know if I've said this before, but worms are, those are, those worms you have up there are invasive. Uh, it technically invasive. Uh, the last ice age, you know, the last, um, icing glaci glaciation event, which wasn't that long ago, it was 12,000 years ago. So during the last glaciation, 
uh, the earthworms were killed uh, in the Northeast. And so I think when Europeans got here, they started digging around and didn't understand when they brought earthworms. Uh, and those earthworms have, um, you know, believe, the, the plants that were up there that had moved back in there as the ice had retreated didn't have earthworms to break down the uh, the the sticks and limbs and all the other things that fall down on the ground, and so they were relying on mycorrhizal fungi relationships to bring them nutrients. And the and the forest floor was just building up with material. The boreal forest up in Canada is just deep, deep, deep in this material. Apparently, earthworms have made it there uh, and are starting to break that carbon unfortunately releasing that carbon into our atmosphere another another carbon sink that we have uh, that's that's in jeopardy but anyway interestingly earthworms uh, did not exist in the Northeast before uh, Europeans got here they would have probably slowly made their way back up there but um, that they weren't uh, at that time but no earthworms will do what they'll they'll appear if you'll just get the soil in good shape okay too much information from Jim uh, somebody asked if row cover color matters, so whatever sh um, frost protection blanket they're using or whatever. Uh, I think white uh, works the best because I'm not, I don't want to actually wake the plants up. And so if I'm trying to cover something, I'm giving it a little bit of protection, but I'm not trying to wake it up. White reflects the sun's energy back out, so it, get, it offers a little bit of warmth you know to the you know the soil is obviously going to be warmer underneath it than the air temperature above it so it offers a little bit of warmth but it reflects the sun's energy out and doesn't heat up so if you're using black or darker colors it's going to absorb heat and potentially wake the plants up underneath it might be beneficial at times but really white you'll see white used more often than not just because we're trying to keep we're trying to offer them some protection from the wind trying to maybe alter the temperature five degrees, but not trying to wake them up and have them grow. So I think that answers that. Uh, somebody asked me um, uh, about, oh, about farfugium dying back and whether that's normal. If you go back and watch the um, taking the covers off uh, post, uh, post cold snap, uh, video that I did earlier this week. I showed my farfugium back there. They just, that's a silly plant. It just, it grows and grows and blooms and blooms and blooms. And then sometime in December or January every year, it just becomes mush. And then it comes back up later. If it didn't go to mush, it, the growth would happen much sooner, but it's because it goes to mush, it's almost May. It's late May almost before I'll see any real growth back on that thing. And then most of that growth happens in September and October on it. Uh, uh, slow to recover from that, but it, it'll recover just fine. Uh, let's see. Um, so last question uh, for this week. I don't know how many this was, but somebody um, asked about lying. They said uh, they just made a comment that they had heard that lying the covers directly on the plants uh, can damage the plants. I guess by the cover freezing to the uh, uh, freezing to the leaves, and that's true. The, you know, most of our plastic row, most of our row cover kinds of things won't do that. Um, the cotton covers that I used at the nursery were, were pretty good about um, releasing from the plants and not doing some damage. But there are some, I, I find like towels and things like that can, if their towel's wet and it freezes to the plant, that you can see a bit of burn where the plant was in contact with the towel. But I can tell you that a little bit of burn from the towel touching the leaf uh, is um, is better than the plant being you know killed back to the ground potentially, and uh, you know building some sort of contraption over something in order to not have the towel actually touch the plant seems like such a you know seems like seems like a, seems like a lot of work. So if you guys have questions, um, ask them down below. Uh, especially questions anything related to uh, winter. Uh, winter damage that you have. Um, in fact, why don't we, um, why don't you send, uh, if you've got photos of something that's damaged and you've got a question about it, maybe I can get something from a photo. Uh, maybe I can't. But if you have something that's damaged, send your photo to horktube at gmail.com and I'll take a look and maybe we'll put a couple up on this week, um, this next week and uh, show those and you know, talk about what, 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 how we might cut it in the spring or whatever, whatever. If I think it'll come back, 
I don't know. Well, maybe we'll get something out of that. So uh, thank you guys for uh, watching and asking questions. And again, that $50 discount on the Learn to Grow series goes away on the 3rd. Thanks for watching.